last week we started talking about biblical value, you know, how, how you should see yourself. And really one of the things that I mentioned was um, being uh, having a balance in this. You know, not, not seeing yourself as too high, but not seeing yourself as too low. Um, so, um, just to summate some of the things that we went over, we are, we are valuable to God just as we are. God doesn't see value based on what we may be. He sees value on, based on what he made us in. Okay? Um, second off, we are incapable, incapable of being good enough. Um, our good deeds are, are not related to, to that to our value at all, nor are nor are our bad deeds. Never say "our" next to "our." It's just terrible. <laughs> um, uh, thirdly, in comparing ourselves to God, we see ourselves as we are. When we compare ourselves to people, we're gonna always find our, uh, find the situation lacking. We're either gonna think that we're so much better than everybody else, or we're gonna think that we're so much worse than everybody else. Either solution isn't very helpful. But when we compare ourselves to God, we start having an, an actual good thing to send to 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 compare ourselves with because we see our faults, but at the same time we see what God has made us. See what I mean? So we see ourselves as still, still we still sin, but we are no longer a sinner. See what I mean? The, the sin no longer reigns within us. It's something that has been has been broken. So even though we are we are you know we still mess up, it's not it, Christ's work is put in our place on that. See what I mean? So. Um, so that means we're valuable to God. So what some people do is they say, you know, I, I'm just such a, you know, like this one up here. You have to value yourself and know that you're worthy of someone um, as loving and caring as you are. See what I mean? You, you are the standard, not, not God, not you are. Oh, well, they just didn't think that I was good enough. See what I mean? It's all about you. Um, and the truth is that, 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 you know, when we're living in rebellion of God, you know, well, I'll get into that in a minute. But, um, and so the power then, uh, any power that, that we experience and that changes us is from God. We don't try hard. I saw something on a, on a church bulletin that irritated the crap out of me when we were in Cloudcroft. It said, don't try harder, do harder. It irritated me to no end. I get the point of encouraging someone to not stop seeking the Lord, yes. But it makes it all about legalism when you say dumb, stupid things like that. How about this instead? Don't try harder, pray harder. That's all right. Let's stick with that. But don't try harder, do harder. Like it, it, it irritated me so. Anyway, it's not important. Um, so the power then doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God, and you see this a lot in movies and music, and just in our culture as a whole. There's this idea that the power is within you, and we talked about this being connected with New Age. Um, we talked about that, and we talked about it being uh, connected with these different things and, and these different worldviews and all that. Um, but even in the church, there's this idea that, in fact, this question was asked: Isn't God's spirit and our spirit the same after we're saved? No. We are still we still have our spirit. God just uses us and he puts his spirit inside of us, like anointing us, right? But nowhere does God's spirit take our spirit's place. You know what I mean? Like that's that's getting way off. Um, and uh, so so then it's not about trying hard, it's not about, you know, be trying to better yourself or trying to you are always going to be you. See what I mean? The power comes from God, not from your self determination. Does that make sense? Kind of? Okay. Um, so then also we talked about what defines us. It was our heart, our standing with God, and our, and our life choices in the now. Not our past, not our um, um, reputation, not our um, the way we appear to people, looks or, or wealth and all those different things. It was none of those things. Um, it was the heart. Uh, so... Um, Comparing ourselves to others, this was the last thing we talked about last week. Comparing ourselves to others and maintaining a secular worldview will cause us to hate ourselves. See, when we um, are comparing ourselves to others, but then also uh, when we when we keep when we keep thinking like the world's thinking, when we listen to secular music and we just accept that without comparing it to the word. See what I mean? It'll cause us to come into a place where we hate ourselves. 
or if we already hit it ourselves, we'll just reinforce that. Um, so then you see the two um, the two extremes here. I just want to feel loved by someone. I want to feel important to someone. I want to feel wanted by someone. You know, you have the two extremes there of look how valuable I am, look how important I am. I, if you guys watch American Dad, I've got big stuff going on. I'm an important person, you know. Uh, whereas this other person is, you know, a whole, you know, what is it the pastor says all the time? I'm so low the ants are ping on me. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so it takes me to something that I hear a lot of pastors talk about sometimes. <coughs> And it starts out somewhat, somewhat like this. Oh, we're all so lowly. We're, we're, we're just so, oh, we're just, people are so terrible and they're so so sinful and they're just, oh, we're, we're all just such sinners. And You know what I mean? That, that, that just down tone. You know what I mean? And I'm not talking about the stuff that um, Joel Osteen does where he goes to the other extreme. He never even mentions sin. He doesn't mention anything like that. He just, everything's about good feelings and, and, and rainbows and everything. Okay, fine. That's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is where a pastor, for the whole hour-long sermon, sits there and tells you how terrible of a person you are, and doesn't give you any, any like, this is what you should do. It's just all about all the terrible things you've done. You know, Oh, well, we're such sinful people, we could never be saved. And then he doesn't stop there. He goes and, you know, even after salvation, you're just a terrible person. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. You know, those doom and gloom pastors. And then eventually, somehow, the conversation always turns to Revelation or something about the end times. Out of nowhere, too, you're all sinners, you're going to hell in Revelations. What? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just out of nowhere, the eternal curveball. Anyways. Um, so yes, people are sinful, and get this, people need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit just to see that they need salvation. Fact, that's true. Because sin has a way of corrupting us, has a way of blinding us to, to the fact. That's true. And it's also true that apart from that Holy Spirit show, enlightening your mind, enlightening your soul, you would never even understand the concept of why you would need grace. That's true. But it doesn't stop there. Um... God gave freely when he gave Christ to any who would believe, and he also, the Holy Spirit, moves in everyone. The Holy Spirit calls everyone. The problem is that not everybody listens. See what I mean? But that's not God's fault. I don't think that God enjoys pronouncing judgment as much as people do. You know, and even when you're praying for someone, like we talked about this when I was talking about the Jehovah's Witness, we're not praying that God would come against them and destroy them. And no, 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 no. We're we're praying that the, yes, the church would close, yes, but we're praying that God would draw them in by His mercy and His love. See what I mean? We're praying that they that they would that they would desire more of God. That's what we're that's what we're at, what we're praying for. See what I mean? We're we're not praying for destruction here. And I think sometimes people get a little bit confused. Um. So. We're not tasked with hating ourselves, but we shouldn't be seeing ourselves as most important either. Um, so there's this idea, if I don't watch out for number one, who will? I gotta watch out for me, you know, or nobody will. And for that, Jesus already addressed this. He talked about when when a sparrow dies, God sees it. He knows. And, and, and he does care for his creation, but it says that we are worth much more than the sparrows. See what I mean? God, God is, God is, God is aware of these things. And so, to that question, if I don't look out for number one, who will? Jesus answered, "Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and don't fear people who can only take away your earthly life, but can't take away the eternal." So, who's number one? Well, God's number one. So we seek after God, and God guards over us. Why, right? That's how that goes. So I mean, but the world has just twisted that. To if you, if you don't, you know, you really got to step up and speak up for yourself, or, or nobody else will. Well, that's just a load of horse crap. We're Christians. It, we're, our, our, it, Paul said to pick up our cross daily and seek out and follow after him. Or maybe it was Jesus. I, I'm blanking out here. Anyways, um, so. Then if you are saved, now now listen to this. If you are saved, you are no longer lowly. That's what people don't understand. Oh, people people are, are low. Yes, people are sinners. But after you've been saved, that's no longer your name anymore. 
You know what I mean? The Bible talks about Christians in a whole different light than it did about those before they were saved. He he calls us children of God. He calls us saints. He called us the, he called calls us redeemed and justified. These are the things that God calls us after salvation. Do we need salvation? Yes. Yes. Does God see value in us before salvation? Yes. God loves all of us. He sees, he sees us as valuable. Yes. However, once we are saved, the slate's clean. See what I mean? That, that, that's just that's just how it is. And any pastor who makes a habit of trumping um, uh, uh, saved people about how terrible and awful they are is just not reading the Bible. See what I mean? Because we stand by Christ's blood. This is all leading into the conversation, so just give me a second. Um, and also, there's another point. People who are stuck in sin rarely need to be told that they are sinners. Most of the time, the Holy Spirit will already beat you to that punch. Just, just thinking ahead there. Um, and a lot of times, the church will try to substitute the, Holy, the working of the Holy Spirit by their own words. So I mean, rather than waiting on the Holy Spirit and seeking after God and expecting for Him to convict a heart, Christians try to, try to kind of try to move it faster and try to play the play the card of conviction before the Holy Spirit can. But I have just the right words to say. Well, I'm really super glad for you, but <laughs> maybe you should think twice before you before you actually do say something. Um, however, I'm not saying we shouldn't mention sin. I'm just saying you catch more flies with, what is it, honey than, what is it, how's it go? Honey than vinegar. Yeah, honey than vinegar. The, you know, that's, that's that's a pretty good point. You know, you, you just because we have to tell people that they're in sin doesn't mean we have to do it without tact. At the opportune time. And oftentimes you won't even have to, like I just said, you won't even have to mention that they're in sin. So... In fact, I'll go a step further. I have yet to meet someone who got witnessed to and then saved, who needed to be told, "You are a sinner. You are horrible, and you need to, you need to repent from your evilness right now." Do you know what I mean? Like, I have yet to see this. So, anyways, um, so a good balance of this: mention God's grace and kindness more than you mention sin. I think that's a, that's a good balance. But uh, a, a good example of this is the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. Somewhere around cha John chapter 8. Somewhere around there. Um, the, the, the people say this woman was caught in the, in the act of adultery. Right? And then after all of it, he basically, uh, you know, gets the other people to leave. Long story short, I'm not going to get too much into that. But then... He says this to her. Then I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. See, it wasn't just, oh, I don't condemn you either. Love and, and cuddles and, and lollipops. But then he said after that, he said, and sin no more. See what I mean? There was a dual, a, a dual, dual focus there, but the thing was, was timing. See what I mean? Jesus knew what to say and when to say it. He did, wasn't just spitting out ignorant things. Um, so love God, love others, and love yourself. And the interesting thing is if you love God, you will learn to love others, which will cause you to learn to love yourself eventually. You just keep seeking after God, and the rest is kind of like a trickle-down effect. Um, but don't draw pleasure from yourself. That is actually the definition of pride, G gaining pleasure from oneself. I just thought that was funny. That's what the dictionary says. Pride, one who one who gains pleasure from themselves. Like, <laughs> that just made me laugh, like, Look how great I am. <laughs> um, but I would add more to that. Pride is focusing on anything other than God. So you have some people who don't go to church anymore because they've been hurt. So I don't go to church anymore. So they have pride in their pain. Pride isn't always you know, that attitude of, I'm better than everyone else. It's just saying that something is better than God. See what I mean? Either your money or your yourself or your sins of the past or whatever whatever is keeping you from focusing on god see what i mean um so anyways so we're good on the recap right any questions about anything we talked about last week okay let's get into the actual this week what are some common self-criticisms not smart enough okay give an example um like let's say 
say you're going to apply for some sort of job or something okay. that has a certain requirement, um, education-wise, and uh, like you have to pass some sort of test, so mm. you tell yourself, well, might as well not even try. Mm. Like talking yourself out of it before yeah. you even get there? Okay. All right. Yeah, that's good. Anything else? Either I'm too fat or I'm too skinny. Mm. Yeah. Especially like people looking at models. And mm. The weight issue, yeah. 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 That's very true. What are some self-criticisms? So, check in Nicole are the only people who <laughs> know about self-criticism? <laughs> you guys are looking at me like I'm strange. Like, I, do, I, do. I love me. <laughs> <laughs> there are the people on the other side. <laughs> I'm too ugly. Okay. So physical appearance? Yeah. How do you think self criticisms negatively affect life or your life? Doesn't have to be your like an actual example from you, but I think we fail to try to do things okay. that we could normally we would could probably accomplish, yeah. except for that we tell ourselves things yes. like that I'm not smart enough, um, I'm not pretty enough. Um, even you know, as a kid, I think all those things start real early. You know, like. Is these kids are smarter than I am, mm. and then like even into adulthood, you know, yeah, um, you you you're constantly comparing yourself to other parents as parent, like super moms, you know, mm. you see things about super yeah. moms all the time, and you're like, I'm not a super mom, I'm a failure as a mom. Like, I'm, <laughs> my kids are lucky if I get up and make them breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, Mike is, Mike is on his own when he gets older. I'll be like, there's cereal in there, I think. Right? <laughs> if not, the store's over there. <laughs> you know, people that are so crafty and, blah, you know, and you're just like, I'm a failure as a mom. I am a failure as a wife. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Just, I think it's because we get caught in that comparing ourselves to other people. That's, I think, a lot of what causes us to criticize ourselves so much. Some of it is just not a clear. Okay. So. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, just. Of our own of, uh, experiences. Okay. Anything else? We start to look down on ourselves. Okay. More than we normally would. We start to think less of ourselves and just stop trying. For when we do try, we don't give it our full effort. Okay. I think sometimes we don't even realize it. Like, um, for instance, I'm thinking that you're stupid. You know, you're working on this project for work or school. And the whole time you're thinking, oh, I'm so, I, I, I don't understand this, I don't understand this, I don't understand this. And then you end up getting an F on it because the whole time you're criticizing yourself and you think you got an F because you don't understand it. The thing is, you weren't trying. So you're trying, you're saying more of like a self destructive mind pattern or, or, yeah, pattern in your mind before you even get to the test? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Or maybe even if you failed at something once, you have now labeled yourself, yourself. as a failure. Yeah. So you kind of set yourself up for future failure based yeah. on one experience. 
Like me with, with, with lemon bars. The first time I made them, they turned out terrible. And every single time I make them, they turn out terrible because I think I make them terrible. You start <laughs> inventing yourself. So, so you're saying that, well, going back to the example of the test, a test that, that you would have been able to pass had you only had self-confidence? And anything else? What was that that you had said, Nicole, there at the end? It, you basically start talking yourself into things. Into okay. Yeah. Like you, you trick your mind. Because I, I know this because my neighbor gets off the off. Oh. Sure, can you stop thinking like that? You're going to start convincing yourself that that's, that that's how it is. When in reality, it's the complete opposite. Mm. A good example of that is, is, is some of the... Um, Addicted persons that we talk to, um, you know, from around, uh, they they have that mindset. You know, I I can't do this. You know, I, I can't. And so they, they just keep telling themselves, I can't, I can't, I can't. And then when they mess up, they say, See, I, I told you I couldn't do it. And then they just kind of stop trying because nobody. I mean, they can't get a job anywhere. You know, and so then they just keep seeing their failures, and then with people all looking down on them because they're drug used, uh, uh, they, you know, have this repeated attitude of, I'm, I'm no good, you know. Were you going to say something? Oh. Anything else? Plow ahead? So, one of the examples that came to mind for me was, I wish I was better looking. Because this is something you hear, I mean, from everybody. High schoolers, adults, men, women, everybody, has, everybody at, at one point in their life says this, you know. Um, there's always that one thing about ourselves that we don't like. And something that I've come to realize is that there is no such thing as a perfect person. We just see ourselves there every day, so we think that oh, there's something <laughs> extremely bad with us. Stop looking in the mirror and you won't see yourself so much. I'm just kidding. Um... So to that, we're going to look at a few passages. To, so I can I can show you a pattern. When destructive thoughts go into your head, okay, combat them with Scripture. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that right now, okay? All right? The self-criticism, and, and, and as an example, is I wish I was, I wish I was uh, better looking. So this is how you combat that. With scripture. Genesis uh, 1 27. And I'll actually start in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, Obviously, when it's talking about in the image of God, he's not talking about the physical appearance, obviously. But we share qualities about God, and God took time in our creation, and he He made us. See what I mean? We're not just a happenstance, or we didn't just evolve from a monkey. God made us, and he makes every single one of us. The Bible says that in the womb, God is the one who forms us. He's the one who's knitting us together. See what I mean? So what that means for us is that when we are criti critical of ourselves, we are complaining against something that God has made, basically. God made you how you are. Regardless of whether you think you're the you're, you're world's best-looking person or the world's ugliest person, God made you exactly as you are. How does Vegetel say it? God made you special, and he loves you very much. See what I mean? It's, it's that, kind of, that kind of realizing that God made you. See what I mean? Um, and I think that in and of itself goes a great deal in helping us, but then you take other passages, and you know, sometimes you'll read a passage and it won't really mean something to you, and then you'll go back and read it again, and read it again, and read it again, and it'll start meaning more to you, you know what I mean? Um, so 1 John 1, 9, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So maybe something to do with it has to do with, oh, I'm just a terrible person or whatever. You you bring in bring in verses like this where it, where it talks about the way that God has has purified. You see what I mean? 
And so you can you can negate those those negative thoughts about you know how terrible of a person you are. Where, well, are you saved? See what I mean? You can you can and, and and it will help you help you feel better because this is what we do. Remember I said sin spreads. Remember that. Let's say you have a problem with your physical image. Eventually, or already, you will have a problem with your spiritual image. Because sin doesn't stop. See what I mean? If you're unsatisfied with your life, chances are you'll be unsatisfied with a bunch of things in your life. Usually people aren't unsatisfied with one thing in their life when they're unsatisfied. You know what I mean? I don't want my glasses. Everything in life is awesome, but, oh man, I hate my glasses. See what I mean? People usually don't, they usually go through a list, right? I have a crappy car, I have a crappy house, I have a crappy job, I have crappy kids, I have a crappy spouse. See what I mean? It just goes from thing to thing to thing, you know what I mean? And, and it doesn't stop there. It, it goes and it goes and goes. So then when you get to your own spiritual, personal life, what do you think is going to happen? See what I mean? Because it's the attitude that's there. It's the attitude that's there. It's, it doesn't matter what the house is actually like, what the marriage is actually like, what the family is actually like. It, those things don't matter. What matters is the heart. Remember I said that? What defines you is the heart. See what I mean? So until the heart changes, there probably isn't going to be too much uh, resolution on the issue. 1 Corinthians uh, 7, 8 says, To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. See, a lot of times with our physical Im image, what do we say? Oh, I'm too ugly to get a spouse. I, 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 can't, I can't get a spouse. Well, what did this just say here? To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Paul never got married. He was fine with it. See, what you need to realize is if you feel like this, I am too ugly for, for whatever, is you need to realize, how do I want to say this? If you are not content here and now, you will not be content then. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I just, I'm not going to move on because I want you guys to just think about that. If you're not content here and now, you won't be content then. I'll give you, I'll give you a few examples. Number one, the husband who is on porn before marriage. Did you know that after he's married, he'll probably still be on porn? But he can he has access to sex whenever he wants. A, no, you really don't. <laughs> but B, even if that was a thing, B, because addictive behavior follows you. Changing your marital status isn't gonna do anything about that. I'll give you another example. Um, well, I wasn't content with with any of my girlfriends. I found faults in all of them, and I slept around with everybody, and I was never faithful to any of them. So I'm gonna get married, because that'll help me stay faithful. Well, probably not, no, because once again, the issue is the heart. If you're not content now, you won't be content then. Some people, oh, you know, I'm so ugly. If I could just, I, I've never even had a girlfriend. If I could just get, if I just get a girlfriend, then they get married. And there's still a problem because their problem was there before. Their heart needed, a, see what I mean? It was their heart. So this passage may not seem to, may not seem like anything, but if you actually just stop and look at it, it really does does give us a lot. We should be content however we are. So, I mean, we're not going to find happiness in or out of a relationship, with or without money. Um, I know some people who have kids because they think they like the idea of a kid. You know what I mean? They, they think that a kid will cause, bring happiness or whatever. And, I mean, hello, kids bring misery. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but you're not going to find that in, in, in having kids, you know? Now, some people just beat themselves up. Maybe they can't have kids. Maybe they, uh, maybe their spouses want to have kids. Whatever, you know, it's not, it's not going to fix it. Second um, Corinthians five one. For we know that if, if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. Now, I'm not really going to get into what he's talking about in Second Corinthians, but the idea is this. Our physical body is temporary. You understand that? Our physical body is temporary. You could literally be the ugliest, physically speaking, person alive, and it wouldn't matter. Your, your physical body is only going to be around for, like, what, 70 years? Maybe if you're real lucky, 90 years? But then it's going to pass away. So, I mean, it's not going to matter in 70 to 90 years. And what is eternity in comparison with 90 years? 
Not that big of a deal, is it? See what I mean? The world around us makes really big deals out of things that really aren't that big of deals. It's things that distract us. Oh, you need to have the smoothest of skin. You can't have gray hairs because that means you're old and old people are useless. You can't have uh, this, that, or the other thing. I mean, that, whatever it is you want to think of. Whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You, when you're looking at your at – your, great example Nicole brought up. When you're looking at, at magazines with models and whatnot, like how, how, uh, how inferior do you feel then? Uh, I don't even – what was that guy's name? Um – the, the male model, um, real famous. No, long flowing blonde hair. Oh. Fabio! <laughs> uh, anyways, sorry, that's uh, off topic. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 12. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. And what he's saying also applies to physical appearance as well. It's not a wise thing to compare yourself physically with other people. So then that comparison of ugly, you realize that the only reason why you have the comparison of ugly is because you're comparing yourself with other people. See what I mean? All of a sudden it removes a big burden, doesn't it? I know some people who, oh, well, I was I was made fun of in high school because I was ugly. High school was high school. I mean, do you, do you know the dumb things high schoolers make fun of each other for? They make fun of each other for not having sex. I mean, goodness sakes, they're really immature. I wouldn't worry too much about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Anyways, um, so that's, that's an example of how you can take a self-criticizing thought and, and take scriptures that mean something to you. Now, it probably there are one or two verses in this list that didn't really mean anything to you. You know what I mean? There's probably one or two. I don't care about that one. But then there, there might have, may have been like one or two that you, oh, now that one really speaks to me. See what I mean? And that's what, what I'm talking about. Go through scripture and compare your thoughts with scripture. And then when you have these destructive thoughts enter your mind, find a scripture that, that, that helps you with that and memorize it. Have it on your mind. It will really help the way you think, and it will help you to stop thinking uh, uh, critically about yourself as an as a added bonus. Um, so, I mean, I already mentioned this. If you aren't happy now, you won't be happy then. Things don't bring happiness. Contentment is a state of mind that is found as we seek the Lord. Now, I do want to clarify something, though, because I wrote on there, joy found in the Lord. It's not like this. Oh, I'm saved, so I'm going to be joyful all the time. Uh, no. No, no, no. And in fact, I would like to put a distinction between joy and happiness. Joy is a state of your mind. Happiness is a temporary feeling. Um, so just to clarify that. And saying off, when I say joy found in the Lord, I mean when troubled times come and you seek the Lord, okay, you will get um, fresh perspective on life and, and on your situation. You will get a fresh perspective. You will get um, a, you will be brought into a new layer of worship. Whereas maybe you've been going through the signal, through the motions, for instance. Once you're once you worship God in the midst of not wanting to worship God is exactly when you truly worship Him exactly where He's wanted you to worship Him the whole the whole time. See what I mean? It's something about dis despair and loneliness that causes us to realize the world's so much bigger than than we saw it before. Um, so we become content no matter what happens around us because our eyes are on something bigger than us. Um, and we get happiness past the hype, past the temporary emotions. We get a, we get a lasting happiness. We get something where we are content in life. That is the joy that I'm talking about. Um, it's it's it's. It's a state of mind. I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, here's another one. I wish I had more money. Hebrews 13:5. And everybody, everybody at one time in their lives wishes they had more money. So, I mean, if, if you're not there yet, you will be. <laughs> Hebrews 13.5. Um, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, what is the focus on? God. It doesn't matter how you live life and uh, wealthier or, or, or poor in this life. See what I mean? It matters where our standing is in the world to come, the life to come. Um, 1 Timothy 6.10. 
says, um, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Um, so he's talking about the way that when our eyes are focused on, 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 on getting more wealth, that sometimes it can lead us to a lot of different things um, that are not good. Proverbs 22.2 The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is maker as the maker of them all. I think that's important. Whenever you're, you're whenever you're done with not being satisfied with your with the wealth that you have, God makes some people rich and He makes some people poor. And then other people, He makes rich and then takes their wealth away from them. And other people He makes poor and gives them wealth. James two five. Listen, my beloved brothers, ha has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And really the idea that here is this. Wherever you are, God can use you. Wherever you are, God can, can work through you. But if you're, if you're focused on stuff like money, you're probably going to miss it. See what I mean? Because your eyes aren't going to be on God. You're just going to be out there in la-la land. You know what I mean? I'll give you an example. Let's say you don't believe in drinking except for um, when you're in, your, in the privacy of your own household, right? Okay, which is fine. I'm not saying anything one way or another about alcohol. I'm circumnavigating that issue. Um, let's say you have an evening that you decide to drink, and you have a little bit too much, and so you're a little bit, say, foggy. And someone comes to the door, and... You answer the door, but because you're a little bit loopy, let's just say, um, you're not able to discern that they need prayer and that, that the guidance that you could have offered them is now lost because you were a little bit intoxicated. So, I mean, that's a good example, a good example of, of what I'm talking about here. Um, when your mind is elsewhere, you're going to miss opportunities that come right by your front door even. See what I mean? Because you're going to be focused on that thing that you, you think will make you happy. See what I mean? You guys get what I'm saying here? Okay. Um, so things in the world will never give us a lasting satisfaction. So then everything that comes into your mind compared with the truth of Scripture. What is it that, that we said a few weeks ago, take, taking every thought captive? Sing Corinthians 10.5. Um... We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Didn't we just talk about that a few weeks ago with the cults? Or a few months ago with the cults? See what I mean? Now this is another way that this, this applies. When destructive thoughts come in, you you have to stop them from happening. See what I mean? It's going to be it's gonna be hard, but one thing you should never do is resign to allow yourself to think these critical thoughts. See what I mean? You should never be okay with it. Fight it while it's still cold today. Fight it. But don't let yourself start giving into these negative thoughts. Don't let yourself believe them. Fight it with your last breath. I mean, people who, who have anxiety attacks know what I'm talking about. Where you genuinely believe the things that you're thinking. It doesn't mean that they're true, but you genuinely believe them. You see what I mean? It's the exact same thing. You've got to stop them. You've got to take control of your thoughts. You've got to fight it. you got to fight it. It's going to be hard. It's not like you're going to, oh, I, I got this down. Okay. You see, it's not going to be that easy. But keep fighting. Keep fighting while you still got breath in your lungs. Keep fighting it. Don't, don't, don't give in. So some noteworthy passages, Romans 3.23. I'm going to go to this other slide right quick. Don't let your happiness depend on something you may lose. C.S. Lewis. Don't let your happiness depend on something you may lose. Just think about that. How many times do we make our happiness based off of things that that are so, that, that we may lose? Looks. Well, age comes to us all. Money. Taxes and taxes and more taxes. <laughs> See what I mean? Like the more you have, the more you're going to be taxed. 
and and people like Sanders are only going to make that worse. The upper class is soon going to be the the middle class. <laughs> It, it, taxes will always be there. The, the, what is it? The two the two constants of life, um, uh, death and taxes. <laughs> okay. So some noteworthy passages. Romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What he's talking about is he's talking about in way of st of of of. Um, the standard before God compared to God in ways of salvation and what he's talking about is everyone needs salvation he's not saying that those who are saved are still scum so, I mean that's not what he's saying before we were saved yes we were sinners we were, we were our hearts were, 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 were against God we were rebels okay fine we're not we're not rebels anymore. We're submitted to God. What he's talking about here is he's only talking about the way that everyone needs to be saved. That's his point. See what I mean? Whenever they're talking, whenever the Bible is talking about people who have accepted Jesus Christ, it always talks about them in a more positive light than this. See what I mean? Always. It never calls them scum of the earth. It never calls them lowly. It never calls them all those stupid things. See what I mean? Because we have a new name once Christ's righteousness is given to us. So then Christ is the one who makes us righteous. This is talking about salvation. All right. Hebrews 11.6. The way I figure it is if a pastor has gone to such great lengths to tell you how terrible people are all the time, I should go to equally great lengths to tell you how saved you are once you have been saved. Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So, um, those who don't obey God are storing up wrath for themselves. We already talked about this. They're spiritually dead. Yes. Okay. That doesn't mean that all deeds are equal. And I'll get to this in, in a minute. But what he's talking about here is the way that you cannot earn your salvation. Okay. The only way that you truly can do works that please God, worship, for instance. Let me give you an example. Let's say we're under the Old Testament. Okay, we're still doing the sacrifices. And I have a thousand head of cattle. And I butcher every single one of them in an offering to the Lord. But my heart is not seeking after the Lord. How much pleasure is God, God going to get from that, even though I slaughtered every single cow that I had? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. See what I mean? Because the issue, the issue wasn't the cattle. The issue was me, right? So now, exact same truth in in New Testament times, exact same thing. Okay. God is not concerned with how much you can sacrifice for Him. See what I mean? The only way to really please God is for your heart to be tuned into His frequency. See what I mean? So in New Testament times, um, let's say I I what's a good example here? Um, I do something for God now with my heart right. Well, okay, now now it's a good thing. See what I mean? Because my heart is in the right place. Now my deeds please Him. See what I mean? Would it be a good thing if my heart was after God to slaughter all the, all all those cat all the, all that cattle and a sacrifice to God to give Him glory and honor? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean that that'd be that would have been a great thing in Old Testament times, um, unless God had told me to do something else with the cattle. <laughs> um, uh, and and that those deeds would have pleased God. That makes sense. Which is why it says here, without faith it is impossible to please God, and faith is, is trusting in the Lord. Uh, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So, um, so then Genesis 6, 5-8. Um, I'm, I'm not going to turn there. Because what I want to talk about here is have you ever heard a pastor say something along the lines of all people, all people are sinners? Yeah, they are all sinners, but there's a difference between bad people and worse people. Salvation aside, okay, there are some people that, that the Bible, even the Bible talks about this, calls them out 
and shows these are people were excessively evil. Okay, I'll give you a few examples. Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, weren't the other people sinning? Yeah, the other people were sinning. Sodom and Gomorrah went above and beyond. They were extremely wicked people. Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, she was an extremely sinful person. See what I mean? So not all deeds are, e are equal. In ways of salvation, there's only two kinds of people, saved and not, and not saved. But in ways of deeds, that's not the factor. See what I mean? There are some people who are worse than other people. Does that make sense? Which is why I've talked about the decisions that we make today really do genuinely matter. And that defines who you are as a person. That will that will defines what character, what caliber of a person you are. See what I mean? Salvation aside, we're not talking about salvation. Are you a person who gives or are you a person who takes? Are you a person who serves or a person who lords it over others? Are you a person who gives up on your happiness for the sake of other people's happiness? Or are you the person, kind of person who goes from thing to thing to thing looking for something that's pleasuring? See what I mean? That defines you. That, that, that defines who, who you are as a person. Um, but First Samuel sixteen seven, you know, says about how the Lord looks at the heart. People look at look at look at your outside, but it's the Lord who looks at the heart. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that there. Um, so okay, this is something that pastors talked about that I think fits in great with this message and with this uh, lesson. You are a doormat if you see yourself as one. Some people say, oh, well, I, I'm not going to let people walk all over me. I, I'm not a doormat. You're a doormat if you see yourself as one. If you don't see yourself as one, you're serving you're serving people because you love God. Or you can see it like this. People are just walking all over me. Or you're serving people. It's however you want to see it. See what I mean? Um, also, life isn't about you. I was actually surprised that this verse was actually in the Bible. Isaiah 58, 10 through 11. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. There's a lot of people nowadays who look for happiness, look for contentment by an inward journey. They look for happiness, they look for contentment by pleasing themselves, by doing things that they enjoy doing. What did Isaiah just say? Just say, It's in self-sacrifice that you're really going to find your contentment in life. It's in self-sacrifice that you're really going to be blessed by God. See the difference in that our world shows us? And value in, in, our, in the world's eyes and culture's eyes is based off of this. It's all about you. Everything in our culture says this. Your worth is, is not based on, on who you are. It's based on the things that, that, that you could potentially uh, give. So, I mean, the things that you could potentially make. Steve Jobs is only valuable because he, he you know, Apple and all that nonsense. Or Gates, he's only valuable because of Microsoft. See what I mean? That, that's how people... In fact, it's even built into our culture like this. Do you know what that person's worth? Our culture has it built into that. They're worth $5 million or $7 trillion or, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Their, their net worth or whatever they call it. It's built into our culture that that's what makes you valuable. See what I mean? Um, but however, um, on a side note, there's no way I can mention this without, without saying this. You don't have to subject yourself to self-harm. Okay? In relationships, you don't have to subject yourself to self-harm. You don't have to be. You don't have to allow yourself to be abused or, or physically harmed, just because you're you're seeking the Lord. That's not something you have to do. Okay, if you are in a position where you need help, um, I think it's very important that you do seek help. Uh, find someone who who's a confidant, um, and, and and who can help you get the help that you need. I mean, there's numbers that I can look up for you. There's you know whatever. If you're in a situation where you don't feel comfortable, that is definitely a situation that you don't have to subject yourself to. Okay, all right. So, um, God loves everyone and desires restoration. These are all just kind of capping everything from last week. See, this this lesson was actually supposed to be last week, so I'm trying to make it into a lesson of its own. 
So if it seems like it's a little bit longer <laughs> than it needs to be, that's why. John 3.17 for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved, excuse me, through him. God loves everyone and desires restoration. We need to start seeing ourselves different than the world tells us we are. See what I mean? And why I keep pounding this in is because you're going to hear it on the TV. You're going to hear it on music. You're going to hear it in the news. You're going to hear it from people. You're going to hear it at, at college. You're going to hear it at work. You're going to hear it at, from your kids when they get home from school. Everything in our culture tells us what makes someone valuable, and it's all wrong. All of it. It's wrong. And so I'm really trying to dive this in because if the culture is doing that hard, making it and pounding it in that hard that you're not a value, then I need to pound it in just as hard that you are a value. Um, so you have to forgive yourself. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, if you guys remember that. Um, do you have to forgive yourself? You have to forgive yourself and accept yourself for who you are while submitting to God to change you. And that might sound like a little bit of a maybe... Um, not hypocritical, but um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Self-defeating point or... Uh, like an oxymoron? Yes, oxymoron. Thank God. All of you were no help. <laughs> that might sound like an oxymoron, so let me explain. You're submitting to God to change the bad things or behavior patterns. Um, this would be things like stealing or being stubborn. Okay. However, your character doesn't necessarily change. Like, for instance, let's say before you before you submit to God, you're a stubborn person. So then you submit to God, and he starts working in you, and you're no longer stubborn, you're, you persevere. Well, isn't that the same thing? It, it, it has the same root, but one is used for bad, and the other one's used for good. Being stubborn is having a strong self-will. Persevering is, is, is keeping to it, not, 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 st not quitting, basically. See what I mean? God can take that bad thing, stubbornness, and turn it into a good thing, perseverance. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. That kind of makes sense? So your character, you'll still be you. You'll just be made into the image of Christ, which means your behavior patterns. Does that make sense? Kind of? I, I, that is a lesson in and of itself. Okay, so I'm trying not to get too much into that because we are going to eventually get to that. Um, ah, just not yet. Because that's like that's like two two weeks lessons in and of itself, um, yeah. um, and why bring that up? Um, you have to forgive yourself and accept yourself while submitting to God to change you. Have you ever heard somebody say this? That's just who I am. You've got a crappy attitude. That's just who I am. You uh, you're awful uppity. That's just who I am. No, that's a learned behavior that you need to unlearn through the help of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> who you are is who you are inside, past the behavior and past that stuff. See what I mean? The things that, 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 that God sees in your heart. I, I, know, I, I know somebody who's extremely, let's just say, easy to be influenced when around others. So they act in a way that's not really them. Have you guys ever met someone like that? And then when they're by themselves, I mean, they act totally different. See what I mean? That kind of makes sense? So there is a difference between, you know, well, that's who they choose to be, yes, in part, and there's kind of a conflict in that person, isn't there? Because their heart is one way, they don't feel good about what they're doing, but yet they're still doing it. See what I mean? So the definition of them is a little bit split, and we'll get into this later. Um, I don't want to turn this into a psychological discussion. Uh, moral of the story being, if you have the attitude of that's just who I am, there's something in you that needs to change. That's, I guess, what I'm really getting down to. Um, and that's through seeking after the Lord. You should never have the attitude of that's just who I am, because God wants to make you into something more. Okay? Um, and yes, you do have to forgive others. You will not have good high self-value if you do not forgive others. You will not have high self-value if you do not forgive yourself. That's just a fact of life. See what I mean? You have to allow God to to change you, all right, while being comfortable with where you are and who you are. Does that make sense? Does that, does that make sense? Kind of. Um, 
It's a very complicated issue, but I'm convinced that there is a very easy way out of it. Keep seeking the Lord. Keep seeking the Lord. Um, you have to seek God's kingdom first, and he has a way of, he just has a way of, of, of working it out um, through the different stuff. He just has his own ways of doing things. Um, yeah. So you will find well, you are, you will find value in that, um, and you will find worth. You will find purpose in this. Um, your your sense of what worth doesn't come from how great you are. That's pride, but how special God sees you. Humble. When you focus on God and compare yourself to God, it will make you humble because God will make you humble. Um, life purpose comes in seeking God and living life His ways. That's how we're going to find purpose in life. Is as we seek after the Lord, God brings by doors. And you know, the people people think, oh, I have to have a special. We talked about this before. A special revelation from God, right? Light from above, to where He's going to show exactly every step that I need to walk in life, and then I'm going to find my purpose. You need to find your purpose before you ever get there. And how you do that, how you find your purpose in life, is in seeking God. A lot of people aren't called to be a, a, a pastor. See what I mean? Uh, ben is a caregiver, okay? But as he seeks after the Lord, God draws open doors by him, and now he's also a what are we calling you guys? Elders, deacons, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Basically, deacon, bishop, elder, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Um, now he's one of those. See what I mean? Because as he sought sought after the Lord, God opened a door. See what I mean? Um, does that kind of kind of make sense? Serena uh, is all, actually also a caregiver, uh, so I, 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 I won't use you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gracie's a, st a stay-at-home mom, but God opened a door for her to be able to lead the kids' church. See what I mean? As we see God, he has a way of, of opening doors for us, and we find our purpose in him. We find our value in him, and we find our worth in him. And so your purpose is not being about being successful. As you seek, God will open doors of ministry. You know, it's not about all those things we, that we put such a high focus on in life. Oh, I need to get a perfect th – this job, I need to go to college so I can get this job so I can work 9 to 5 so I can work my way up the, up the ladder and become the CEO of this business. It's not It's not about it. – It's not. you're, you're not going to find purpose if that is your goal there. See what I mean? You're going to find purpose as you seek after the Lord. God made you exactly as he wanted you. He is working in you, and one day he will perfect you. You are, as an individual, who God made you. That doesn't mean that you're perfect. There, there are some things that, that, that you have learned over your life that God wants to work out of you. There are some things that you were born into that God wants to work out of you. However, God made you as he, as he, as he wanted to, and he, one day you will be perfected. Okay. So, when you hear yourself start thinking, I'll always be like this, ask yourself this, will you though? Will you though? See what I mean? So, any questions about anything we talked about? No? We're all good? Yeah? Okay. So the question of the week. Uh, pick one of these. How much interest would you pay on an $8,000 car loan with a 3% interest rate and a four-year term? I want you guys to try and figure it out. How much interest would you pay? Or this one. How much interest will you pay on a $50,000 house loan at 4% interest and a 30-year term? And next week we'll be talking about financial control.